Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Sam and this is the Crafty Blinder van build. Today we're installing my inverter. The inverter I've chosen to install is this from Edico. It's a 1500 watt pure sine wave and it has a surge power of 3000 watts. Why did I choose this one? Well, dead simple. It got quite a lot of good reviews at the time when I was looking at it and there were so many out there. I chose, I chose off, off the reviews to be honest. So this, um, I'll just show you, comes with two outlets, comes with two USBs and a digital display. It also comes with a remote control switch, which I had mounted in the kitchen area. <coughs> Excuse me. So when it comes to selecting your inverter, what you need to consider is your maximum demand. Um, and add about 50, 30 to 50 percent of uh, in addition to that. So the biggest item I want to power is an 800 watt microwave. So I've chosen this 1500 watt inverter, which is around about 30 odd percent, 30 40 percent greater than what I need. So we're going to be installing this today. Pretty straightforward. A um, couple of things to consider. One is what you're going to power off it. I've just said I chose this one because I know that I'm only going to be powering a microwave. However, this still has a function to give me that little bit more if I needed. So we're not going to plug anything else into this other than the supply back to the change of the switch. So everything that's mounted on the fuse board can be powered through this. Not that I would do that. I don't think I will need to do that. But it just gives us that extra option. What else is there? The second thing to consider is the location, where you're going to store it. So my location is going under the front seat. So before you start, you need to consider it needs to be in a fire, I wouldn't say proof, but a, a location where there's no combustible materials. So this is a metal box. The only combustible material on it is the seat, but under the base of that seat, there's metal as well. I'm sure that if something went wrong with this, I would smell it. And I'll be honest with you, if you smell an inverter going wrong, it's a smell that you'll never ever forget. They don't smell too good when they go. So this will be mounted under the seat. Um, and we might as well get on with it. Let's get it stuck in. Before I install the inverter, Let's just recap on what we have. For two 120 AGM batteries, I've just installed these. These are new. Um, these are heavy duty buzz bars. Um, I wanted a little bit of protection. When I installed the swivel base, I didn't realise how big the gap was that's underneath the seat. Um, something I hadn't considered. And one of the issues I had was the exposed live terminals. So I found these caps, um, scrap yards and <laughs> other places, but that just gave me a little bit of reassurance that, uh, just need to fix that one down, I've just had it off. This gave me a little bit of reassurance that I wouldn't drop anything on top of the battery terminals and, and cause a, a short or um, damage of my batteries really. Not bothered about the earths, the, you know, that earth, that earth, so it doesn't really matter. But I did have a concern about this. Also, um, as the project's grown, I've added quite a lot of stuff in. So I needed additional additional ways. And I bit the bullet and bought these. They weren't cheap. I think they were about 40 quid each. But they do a fantastic job. Um, I'm very happy with them now. Another little addition is this. This is a, a charging point for my battery. So when winter comes or um, I'm on a caravan site where I've got a hookup, I can plug this Noco Genius 5 in and keep the batteries nice and conditioned um, along with, with the solar topping up through the day. This is, if you want to buy a battery charger, this little thing is awesome. It does 12 volt, it does, a, uh, sorry, it does lead acid, it does AGM and it even does lithium and it'll even do 6 volt. Once it's got your battery up to charge, it starts conditioning it. 
So, <laughs> for what I paid for that, I think it was about 40 quid again. I'll, I'll put the description in the link. But that there is, I love it, I love it. What I've done though is, I've got these ends, so it just sits in there, like a little cradle. You'll see it when it's all finished. It sits in that cradle and it plugs into here. And this is a supply back from the fuse board. So when we're parked up, uh, we're hooked up to the mains. That'll be feeding the battery charger and keeping us all topped up. Right, on to the rest of the system. This is our connection back to our changeover switch. So this is what's going to be coming out the back of the inverter. This is the remote switch for the inverter. I'd extend that. I've got a five meter length in. And um, the one that come was about three, three, four meters. It was short anyway. And I didn't want to run the risk of having to pull a second one in. So I pulled one in and it was just the right length. So happy I did that. 200 amp MCB. This will be on the supply to the inverter. And there's a reason behind that. Inverters, by the nature of them, will constantly draw charge. So this is where I will be switching it on and off from. Um, this will reduce what's known as parasitic draw. When you're running off your batteries and you want to preserve what's in your batteries, you don't want your inverter just sitting away in the background, chipping away at it, it's taking a little bit out at a time. So this MCB will be acting as my switch. So when I'm not using the inverter, it'll be off. And that's how I'm gonna run this system. So the cables that come with the kit are only 16 mil. I've decided not to use them. Um, don't think they're adequate for for this system. Even though it's only over a short distance, I still think it would be too much. So I'm making my own. Got some cable left over another job. So I've just run the cables round, got them to the required length. I'm just crimping them off now. Happy days, that'll do that. So, I'm going to use black again for the red side, but I'll mark it up um, so we know it is. It is alive, which isn't a problem. Take on that cable now. So, what we'll do is we'll feed that down. plan is do all the install work first, the cable in, and then when we come to put the inverter in, it's just a matter of two connections. Oh, I thought that was loose, that's that's actually part of the of the nut. Cool. When you're installing your battery links, just consider where you're going to run these cables. You don't want them to be chafed, you don't want them to get caught or damaged. So what I try and do is use the cable ducts in the vehicle, the runs, the entries that are already built in, 
and tie, cable tie the cables to other cables that are in that area. This will help protect the cables from being damaged by movement and vibration. When you're measuring the length of your link cables, I tend to push a little bit excess into the corners, um, try and leave a little bit on in case the crimp fails or we need to do an alteration at some point. Another tip is just score the cable with the shears. Don't try and cut right through in one go and then tidy up with a Stanley knife. So the idea there was you don't saw keep going around like that. All you do there is cut the strands. All we're doing is we're trying to separate. Sheath from the internal cores. We don't want to damage any of them strands like that. So it up. Only expose enough copper to fit inside the crimp. The plastic outer sheath should sit right upon the collar of the crimp. And then it's just a matter of crimping it with a proper tool. Um, I've seen some guys punching these with chisels and all sorts. I wouldn't recommend that. If you're going to do this work, get the right tools and do the job right. Once again, we need to distinguish this cable from the other black cables. This is a 12 volt supply and it needs to be shown as such. And using a red tape to, to mark this cable and distinguish it from all the others is more than adequate. Once you've done this, it's just a matter of terminating it, putting it to bed. So we need to connect it to the buzz bar. Now here's a little tip. Always use insulated tools when you're working on your batteries. If you can't find insulated tools or don't have the money to buy them, you know, they are quite expensive, use insulation tape. Just cover up the ends. Anything that could come into contact with an earthed part of your vehicle, like the frame of the seat or, or any other part of your vehicle, just put some insulation tape on it. It's a cheap alternative. All right, son. Yeah. Where you are? Who this apple? Pardon? Who want this apple? No way. I don't want it. You don't want it anymore? Mm-mm. Bring it here, then. Put it in my hand, boy. Thank you. Love you. See ya. Wouldn't want to be here. One of the positives of building this van at home on the drive is I get moments like that. Um, if I was doing this in a shed somewhere or on a farm in somebody's barn or whatever, I'd miss out on them moments. And I think you have to cherish them little bits, them interruptions. They're brilliant. So sometimes you have to make a decision on how you're going to make a connection. Now, this earth bar is getting quite congested. So I didn't have an entry point where I wanted it. So I had to make the cable long enough to go around behind terminals to terminate onto the furthest point away from where I really wanted to be. But you have to do what you have to do. This rail come with two two 8mm studs and all the rest are like little 6mm screw-ins which is ideal for the smaller equipment but I could have done with a couple of bigger points to uh, to terminate onto. When it comes to tightening up these nuts on the buzz bar resist the temptation to go too far all I do is I nip it up gently with my hands and then I give it a little nip and that is more than enough. That cover goes back on.
So when I bought the inverter, I mounted it straight on the side of the seat in unit. And this was to protect it really, stop it sliding around, getting damaged and parts lost. So this is just a quick install now. It's a matter of taking out four screws. Well, actually only two, because I've got two backed out far enough to locate it on. And then the other two will be put in just to secure it in position. And the final piece in the jigsaw is the link from the MCB down to the inverter. Once we've got this on, we're ready to start looking at testing it. Before switching the inverter on, we need to plug in the remote switch. You shouldn't do this when it's switched on, you should always do it when it's isolated. Last but not least, we need to plug in the cable that goes back to the changeover switch. This is our output from the inverter, and we'll need this to prove that the RCD works. So we're live. I'm going to make a little cover to cover this switch. These terminals are a bit too exposed for me. All live comes from the battery, through the switch, onto the inverter. Our earth runs back up. And on to the batteries. I'll switch down here, you should see the blue light come on. That's the display on, and that is the inverter working. The case is earthed to the chassis, so if anything goes wrong inside it, it should blow the fuses inside it. That is not the earth for the system. <sighs> this is this is the bit I've been dreading trying to explain to you. So what we have is we have a negative and a positive so live and neutral basically in domestic terms so but let's just get that straight these are dc so you've got plus and negative going into this piece of equipment which basically takes the 12 volt dc and steps it up transforms it up into 230 ac but it doesn't have an earth. It has what's called a floating earth. Basically, there's no earth connected to the source. So if you plug something into this, it's not going to have an earth. But the way we've designed the system, we have an earth coming back into this point. So this cable is running from the fuse board and it has an earth in it. And everything connected therefore after that that way is earthed follow me <laughs> it, it is a strange subject to talk about floating earths are not commonly known but when using an inverter it's always suggested that you should use class 2 equipment and class 2 equipment is basically double insulated internal parts so there's no way you can get come into contact with them so they don't require an earth, a radio, it has two cores going to it. Um, battery chargers um, for your power tools, they're the same. So it is a weird subject, but it's something to consider. So if you plug a plug top tester into these, and I'll show you one of them in a little while, it won't work properly, it won't show you what you would expect to see. However, I've tested this electrical installation. It is perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. It meets all the criteria. Disconnection times, bang on. And the RCD works. Floating earths. Basically, you don't have an earth here because there's not one generated there. And we've earthed it that way. Coming into the system. Because when we plug it in to the mains, we want it earthed. But when we have it selected to inverter, we're bringing the earth to the party if you want for want of a better word we're bringing the earth from the switch gear back up to here it doesn't go anywhere but it just means everywhere from this point on on the plug top is earthed it's a bit convoluted it's maybe a bit too much detail but i thought i should discuss the topic 
If anybody's got a better way of explaining it, please let me know, because I've wrapped my brain. The last part of this install is the Norco battery charger. So that plugs into this point here and connects in here. Now if I ever need to take that out, I can just split it there and use these cables here to charge up any other battery I've got. Handy little bit of kit. And if we're away somewhere and somebody needs to charge the battery up, we're going to have these at our disposal as well. So we just keep them sat in the bottom of there. That's it done. Okay. Let's switch it on there. Check for a blue light there. Switch it on here. So we're going to select the inverter. We've got power from the inverter. We're now going to check the RCD. And the RCD works fine. I'm happy with that. We'll now power up the microwave. And let's put the fridge on as well. And let's see how it performs. I actually put the fridge on battery. So what we'll do is, as we have it plugged in, we'll put it on there. And let's power that up. So we'll let that run for a minute. Obviously my batteries need a bit of a charge, they've dropped down straight away. In a while things are running. Just come and check the cables. Make sure nothing's getting hot. Everything seems to be working fine. Now, the display says we are pulling... We have 213 volts currently, and we're pulling 6.2 amps. Not bad, considering the batteries aren't completely charged. Um, yeah, I'm happy with that. I think that's a pass. I'm really happy with that. Everything's working fine. Um, no problems. So we've got the fridge on now, we've got the, the microwave on, and everything's worked great. So I think that's a good job done. Okay, I want to discuss this thing with you. This is a plug top tester. I recommend you buy one, stick it in your van. It's ideal for when you pull onto any side, you can just plug it in, and it will tell you if everything's wired correctly. So you know the wiring's correct on your van, um, but sometimes you can go to the site and maybe somebody's been in a hurry or not done his job or not known what he's been doing. But in all reality that shouldn't happen because your site should be checked and tested regular by a qualified electrician. Anyway, this will show you. Three green lights means it's correctly wired. A red light in the middle, that means you've got a missing earth. Two red lights to the right hand side means you've got a live earth reverse and Two red lights on the outer extremities means live neutral reverse. That is, that is it. But this one also has another function. That has just tested my RCD. So, I wouldn't recommend using that on a campsite because that might take out the RCD that supp supplies the whole leg um, that you're on the pitch that you're on. So. Um, Hopefully it would take out your nearest RCD, but what we kind of find on a lot of the sites is it will take out the main one back at the distribution board for that leg of, of um, the campsite. So maybe not do that one. Do it at home um, when you've got it plugged in just to prove it and test things. But that's it. Now I'm going to show you what happens when you're on inverter power. So when you plug the tester in while you're on inverter power, you get a little disco. Now basically, it's confused. It doesn't know what's happening. It's saying there's no earth, but we know that everything works correctly. We've had the microwave on. We've had the fridge on. It just doesn't work with an inverter. Now this might just be too sensitive 
for what um, for what I'm wanting to do, but uh, that's a problem I had. Now, when I was talking to you before about class two equipment, see the little square within a square. That means that this is class two equipment. So this has no parts that you could come into contact with, really. So that's a little bit of a bonus as well. Hope you enjoyed that video. That's how I installed the inverter in my van. Um, and that is the last of the services. We've installed the solar, we've installed the batteries, we've installed the CTEC, we've installed the hookup points, we've installed the, the water tanks and the water filling points, we've got the boiler in there, we've got the solar, blah, 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 blah. yeah, we've got everything in, that's it, it's done. Um, we've got the heater in, so we've got heat, we've got power and... We've got free energy from the sun as well. We've got the ventilation in. There's nothing left for me to do apart from the water system. So <laughs> we've got all the bits in place now. We've got all the services in place. We've got the 12 volt. We've got the we've got the water heater in. It's now time to show you the video about how we installed our water system and the hot water side of it to the sinks and everything else. So there's a little bit. It's a little bit out of sequence because we built the cabinets and then we plumbed it but i think for anyone who's building a van and following the channel maybe the water's the next one to show you because there is a little bit um that i didn't consider i had to put a channel under the floor so before i put some of the parts in i had to tape out the floor out again because i hadn't thought about it i didn't want to run the pipe work outside um, because i didn't want it to be influenced by the weather so it's in, in the insulated floor and it's a, it was a quick job, but it's a job I should have considered a bit earlier. But anyway, that'll be the next video. Thanks for watching and if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, like and share it with your friends. I'm blown away. This last week, um, this last couple of weeks to be honest, we've gone from 70 odd subscribers up to 100 and odd, then we've broke 200. And the day we broke 200, it went, it just started picking up really, really quickly. Um, and I appreciate that. Some of the comments that we're getting through, the interaction on the comment side is fantastic. Some of the questions are pushing me to, to answer them as well and my logic behind them. Um, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the um, advice that you're giving me as well. You know, there was something I hadn't considered with the gas tank, I hadn't positioned it quite correctly. Some of you guys picked that up and let me know and we've gone and rectified that. Uh, what else was there? There's a, a, a Mercedes mechanic, um, Lee. He's pointed out a couple of things to me as well about my water tank and when, my, when the DPF does a, does a regen, it can produce a lot of heat. And maybe I should have uh, put a, a a shield in front of my waste tank now we are aware of that and it, it just so happened that come up in conversation with my brother because i've been on a long run and i wondered if the engine had done a regen because it hadn't been on a long run for a long time and we were just considering is there a way of telling telling if that's happened um i have been looking at the tank because when i positioned it i thought it's a bit close to the exhaust maybe it needs something there so we've been monitoring it and as it stands now the tank hasn't took any damage there's no issues with it um, but that might not be the case for some other people so it's well worth considering and it's a valid point that Lee raised so thanks for the interaction Lee thanks to everybody else that's sent me questions Alan keep the questions coming mate I do appreciate them and believe you me it's not a problem but um, thanks again I'm really enjoying this it's it's a uh, it's been a really good experience real positive experience and if my mistakes help you build a better van than I've got. Great, well done. I, I've built my van for me and my family to enjoy, and we have been. We've been away in it. We've we've done our first run away. We needed to get away. We'd had a crap week. We had to put our best friend Dexter to sleep. Um, the time had come. Emotional time. Wasn't a choice we made lightly, but we've had to let him go and 
to stop his suffering really. He was blind, he was going a little bit, he just wasn't right and we could see it and the vet had even told us you know we should consider putting him to sleep and um, we we had a good couple of weeks with him. We've uh, we spoiled him rotten, new toys, walks, ice creams, his favourite thing. But yeah, he's gone now. So we needed a little bit of space. We needed to get out the house. We needed to get away from all the reminders and and just go and and chill out. And we did that, and it was eventful. We got to our destination, and we didn't have water. <laughs> I'll explain that in another video sometime. Um, it just. You think you've checked all the boxes and something's ready to come and bite you in the bum but anyway we had a we had a great time but like i say thanks for watching thanks for contributing thanks for subscribing i'm absolutely loving it and keep it up i appreciate it i really do see you next time